Hello, my name is Teresa Pulterova. I am a senior writer at Space.com and last month I caught up with Dante Loretta, the chief scientist of NASA's OSIRIS-REx mission. OSIRIS-REx was NASA's first mission to collect a sample from an asteroid. The spacecraft will deliver this sample to Earth on September 24th. This will be only the third space rock fragment humankind will have brought to Earth. Japanese missions Hayabusa 1 and Hayabusa 2 previously delivered to us pieces of asteroids Itokawa and Ruigu. Unlike meteorites, which are also fragments of asteroids, these samples are protected from the heat of Earth's atmosphere during their arrival, as well as from contamination on the planet's surface. Scientists hope that these pristine samples could help them shed light on the origins of life in the solar system. OSIRIS-REx launched in 2016 and spent two and a half years orbiting a space rock called Bennu, which is the potentially most dangerous asteroid known to humankind. The spacecraft journey has been far from uneventful and completely changed what scientists had thought that asteroids were all about. Here is what Dante Loretta has to say about the mission and its challenges. OSIRIS-REx rendezvoused with near-Earth asteroid Bennu in December of 2018, and right away I knew we were in for a real challenge. Even though we had done an extensive astronomical campaign to characterize this asteroid, we really had some um, major surprises. Most importantly, when we looked at the thermal data, the asteroid surface heats up and cools off really quickly, which we interpreted as fine grain material, kind of like a beach. In fact, I used the word beach repeatedly when I was describing the surface early in the mission concept. Instead, we saw something that was just covered in large, rough, and rocky boulders everywhere. And there was no smooth areas easily identifiable of the kind that we designed the spacecraft to go down and sample. It also became really apparent that this is not a solid body. This is actually now what we term a rubble pile. And it seems like most small asteroids are this kind of object, a very loose accumulation of boulders and dust and gravel, probably formed after a giant catastrophic collision in the main asteroid belt hundreds of millions of years ago. You actually designed the mission with a wrong assumption. Uh, was there actually a real risk that you wouldn't be able to touch down and collect the sample? Yeah, when we designed the spacecraft, we had a guidance targeting accuracy of about 50 meters. And we based that on knowledge from a prior mission from the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency called Hayabusa, which was the first spacecraft to rendezvous with one of these small objects. And it had nice 50 meter wide smooth patches. And we thought Bennu has to be more benign than Itakawa. So we were really using that prior knowledge to drive uh, our concept for getting to, to this asteroid. And the telescopic data seemed to confirm that, right? The thermal properties, also the radar properties, it really looked like this smooth surface. So when I first saw that, I thought we might be in trouble here. Mm -hmm. So uh, how did you go about this challenge? How did you eventually manage to find a landing spot? So the one thing I say, when you launch a spacecraft, the only thing that you can fix is the software. So we had to make the spacecraft smarter. When we launched, we were using a laser altimeter for the final guidance down to the asteroid. Because we were expecting these big smooth areas, we just thought we needed to know that we were coming down at the right rate towards the surface. Instead, we had to completely change that strategy using the onboard cameras and performing an extensive mapping campaign, sometimes mapping features as small as a couple centimeters to put into the spacecraft's memory so it could make real decisions and guide itself down to the safe location, which turned out to be only about 10 meters across. Even within the area, there were still hazards, spacecraft killing boulders, and we taught the spacecraft where they were and what they looked like. And if the spacecraft determined it was coming down on a boulder, it would actually reverse engines and fly away and come back and try to sample another day. The challenges didn't end with selecting the landing site. I know that when you actually attempted the touchdown, something happened totally unexpected. Could you just remind us of what happened there and what did that teach you about asteroids? Yeah, I'd love to go back to our early concept animations of the sampling event where the, the device is called the TAGSAM. It's the touch and go sample acquisition mechanism. It's about 30 centimeters in diameter and it's basically an air filter 
and we blow down the gas kind of like a leaf blower designed to push the material up into that sample collection chamber. And you can tell we thought the surface was going to be nice and hard and, and, and provide resistance to the downward motion of the spacecraft. And we thought we would just collect the surface level of gravel and dust. Instead, Bennu, which I call the trickster asteroid, the surface responded kind of like dropping into a pool of water. There was absolutely no resistance to the downward motion of the spacecraft. We made contact at 10 centimeters per second. One second, we were 10 centimeters down into the surface, and we continued to push down about 50 centimeters deep. Thankfully, the back away thrusters still fired and we were able to safely retreat from the asteroid surface with our precious cargo in hand. Uh, do you have an idea what would happen if an asteroid like Bennu would, uh, be, would have been the target of the DART mission, the other NASA asteroid mission, the one designed to deflect a potentially dangerous asteroid? Yeah, the DART mission was a huge success. This was NASA's first attempt at planetary deflection, using a kinetic impactor to change the orbital velocity of an asteroid, the same kind of technology we would like to employ if there was a real asteroid threat. And when I saw the images of Dimorphos, which was a satellite of a larger asteroid that the DART spacecraft impacted, it looked really familiar. It looked like a bouldery pile of rubble, more shaped like an American football than Bennu, but still that same kind of characteristic texture. And the mission was phenomenally successful. It imparted a lot of momentum to the asteroid, substantially slowed its orbital velocity. And a large part of that is because there was so much material that was ejected from the surface, uh, that transfer of energy resulted in a significant change in the orbital period. I guess that's important because Bennu might actually in the future be a target of such a deflection mission for real, right? Yeah, Bennu is known as the most potentially hazardous asteroid in the solar system. And I don't want people to panic. The odds are still low, about 0.05%. And if the impact's going to occur, it'll be in the year 2182. So we have a lot of time and we are now just starting to develop the technologies and the strategies. I think the people of the future will be well equipped to deal with Bennu, especially because of the enormous amount of information that we've collected. I like to think of it as one of our gifts to the future. Wonderful. So I said at the beginning that OSIRIS-REx will deliver this precious piece of asteroid Bennu to Earth in September. How are you guys preparing for this big moment? Yeah, it's kind of the culmination for me of almost 20 years of my career getting ready for this big event on September 24th. And the spacecraft's on its journey back to the Earth. It's getting closer every day. About four hours before it hits the top of the atmosphere, it will release the sample return capsule, which is about 80 centimeters in diameter. And it looks like a mini version of the capsules that astronauts come back from space in. Uh, the spacecraft will then uh, fire its engines and continue to orbit the sun. The capsule will hit the top of the atmosphere uh, 27,000 miles per hour or about 12.4 kilometers per second and it'll parachute into the Utah desert in the southwestern United States. And we've been rehearsing and practicing. We have to interface with the United States military because it's their uh, land that we're coming in on. And uh, we've been going out and doing the exact procedures that we expect to do on the day of the event. We've built a beautiful uh, clean room at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas to receive the samples. And we've done a lot of rehearsing because my science team gets 25% of the sample, but we never really defined which 25%, how do you pick the 25%? So we've been going through a lot of decision-making kind of scenarios and rehearsals, tension, you know, what's it gonna be like if everybody wants the same thing to kind of, Get all that out of the way. So by the time we're actually doing this for real, I know I'm gonna be in a highly emotional state. You wanna have just that mu muscle memory, right? You just wanna kinda of go on autopilot. You know what to do, you got a job, get it done. And then the real holiday begins, right? We get those samples in our laboratory, the ones I've been dreaming about since 2004. When do you think we can expect first science results from the sample? Well, I'm advocating for as quickly as possible. Uh, if everything goes according to plan, we'll have the science canister opened up. This is the protective aluminum shell where the tag SAM and the sample are contained. And given uh, one of the other surprises that we had is when we backed away and we looked at the sample collector, there was material that was escaping. So we kind of went into an emergency mode to quickly stow it. I think there's gonna be dust all over the inside of this uh, canister. And our plan is to sweep it on day two, we have a set of amazing instruments right there in Houston, and I think we'll have information within a few days, at least 
the basic understanding, did we bring back what we expected or did Bennu continue to surprise us?